Take this though. The greatest cowboy of all time. Pico Spill becomes a coyote. Pico Spill had the strangest and most exciting experience any boy ever had. He became a member of a pack of wild coyotes, and until he was a grown man, believed that his name was Cropier, and that he was a full-blooded coyote. Later, he discovered that he was a human being, and very shortly thereafter, became the greatest cowboy of all time. This is how it all came about. Pico Spill's family was migrating westward through, te through Texas in the early days in an old covered wagon with wheels made from the cross sections of a sycamore log. His father and mother were riding in the front seat, and his father was driving a wall-eyed, spavined roan horse and a red and white spotted milch cow hitched side by side. The 18 children in the back of the wagon were making such a medley of noises that their mother said it wasn't possible even to hear thunder. Just as the wagon was rattling down to the ford across the Pecos River, the rear left wheel bounced over a great piece of rock and Bill, his red hair bristling like porcupine quills, rolled out of the rear of the wagon and landed up to his neck in a pile of loose sand. He was only four years old at the time, and he lay dazed until the wagon had crossed the river and had disappeared into the sagebrush. It wasn't until his mother rounded up the family for the noonday meal that Bill was missed. The last anyone remembered seeing him was just before they had forded the river. The mother and eight or ten of the older children hurried back to the river and hunted everywhere, but they could not but they could find no trace of the lost boy. When evening came, they were forced to go back to the covered wagon and later to continue their journey without him. Ever after, when they thought of Bill, they remembered the river, and so they naturally came to speak of him as Pecos Bill. What happened to Bill was this. He had strayed, strayed off into the mesquite, and a few hours later was found by a wise old coyote who was the undisputed leader of the loyal and approved pack of the Pecos and Rio Grande Valleys. He was, in fact, the granddaddy of the entire race of coyotes, and so his followers, out of affection to him, called him Grandy. When he accidentally met Bill, Grandy was curious but shy. He sniffed and he yelped, and he ran this way and that, the better to get the scent and to make sure there was no danger. After a while, he came quite near, sat up on his haunches, and waited to see what the boy would do. Bill trotted up to Grandy and began running his hands through the long, shaggy hair. What a nice old doggy you are, he repeated again and again. Yes, and what a nice croppier you are, yelped Grandy joyously. And so, ever after, the coyotes called the child croppier. Grandy was much pleased with his finding, and so, by running ahead and stopping and barking softly, he led the boy to the jagged side of Cabezon, or the Big Head, as it was called. This was a towering mass of mountains that rose abruptly, as if by magic, from the prairie. Around the base of this mountain, the various families of the loyal and approved packs had burrowed out their dens. Here, far away from the nearest human dwelling, Grandy made a home for Cropier and taught him all the knowledge of the wild out of doors. He led Cropier to the berries that were good to eat and dug up roots that were sweet and spicy. He showed the boy how to break open the small nuts from the piñon, and when Cropier wanted a drink, he led him to a vigorous young mother coyote who gave him of her milk. Cropier thus drank in the very lifeblood of a thousand generations of wildlife and became a native beast of the prairie, without at all knowing that he was a man-child. Grandy became his teacher and schooled him in the knowledge that had been handed down through the thousands of generations of the pack's life. He taught Cropier the many signal calls and the code of right and wrong and the gentle art of loyalty to the leader. He also trained him to leap long distances and to dance and to flip-flop and to twirl his body so fast that the eye could not follow his movements. And most important of all, he instructed him in the silent, rigid pose of invisibility so that he could see all that was going on around him without being seen. And as Cropier grew tall and strong, he became the pet of the pack. The coyotes were always bringing him what they thought he would like to eat, and were ever showing him the many secrets of the fine art of hunting. They taught him where the field mouse nested, where the song thrush hid her eggs, where the squirrel stored his nuts, and where the mountain sheep concealed their young among the towering rocks. When the jackrabbit was to be hunted, they gave Cropier his station, and taught him to do his turn in the relay race. And when the pronghorn antelope was to be captured, Cropier took his place among the encircling pack and helped bring down the fleeting animal in spite of his darting, charging antlers. Grandy took pains to introduce Cropier to each of the animals and made every one of them promise he would not harm the growing man-child. 
Arr, growled the mountain lion. I will be as careful as I can, but be sure to tell your child to be careful too. Grrr, growled the fierce grizzly bear. I have crunched many a marrow bone, but I will not harm your boy. Grrr. Yes, we'll keep our perfumery and our quills in our inside vest pockets, mumbled the silky skunk and porcupine, as if suffering from adenoids. But when Grandy talked things over with the bull rattlesnake, he was met with the defiance of hissing rattles. Nobody will ever make me promise to protect anybody or anything. I'll do just as I please. Be careful of your wicked tongue, warned Grandy, or you'll be very sorry. But when Grandy met the Wowser, things were even worse. The Wowser was a cross between the mountain lion and the grizzly bear, and was ten times larger than either. Kind of scary looking. Besides that, he was the nastiest creature in the world. I can, o I can only give you fair warning, yelled the Wowser. And if you prize your man-child, as you say you do, you will have to keep him out of harm's way. And the Wowser continued. And as the Wowser continued, he stalked back and forth, lashing his tail and gnashing his jaws, and acting as if he were ready to snap somebody's head off. What's more, you know that nobody treats me as a friend. Everybody runs around behind my back, spreading lies about me. Everybody says I carry hydrophobia, the deadly poison, about on my person. And because of all these lies, I am shunned like a leper. Now you come sneaking around, asking me to help you? Get out of my sight before I do something I shall be sorry for. I'm not sneaking, barked Grandy in defiance, and besides, you're the one who will be sorry in the end. So it happened that all the animals, save only the bull rattlesnake and the wowser, promised to help Cropier bear a charmed life so that no boy, no harm should ever come near him. And by good fortune, the boy was never sick. The vigorous exercise and the fresh air and the constant sunlight helped him to become the healthiest, strongest, most active boy in the world. All this time, Cropier was growing up in the belief that he was a full-blooded coyote. Long before he had grown to manhood, he learned to understand the language of every creeping, hopping, walking, and flying creature, and, boy-like, he began to amuse himself by mimicking every animal of his acquaintance. He soon learned to trill and warble like a mockingbird, and to growl like a grizzly bear. He could even yowl like a wowzer and sputter like a stupid skunk. The coyotes didn't much like this mimic language, for they were never sure whether they were hearing a sage hen, or a buffalo, or a cricket or whether it was merely Cropier at his play. But Cropier was so full of animal spirits and healthy mischief that he could never keep long from the sport. In time, he became so expert as a mimic that he could confuse even the rattlesnake or the field mouse or the antelope. He could thus call any animal to himself, assume the rigid pose of invisibility, and completely deceive the cleverest creature alive. By the time Cropier had become a man, he could run with the fleetest of the coyotes, at night, he squatted on his haunches in the circle and barked and yipped and howled sadly, according to the best tradition of the pack. The loyal and approved packs were proud indeed that they had made a man-child into a noble coyote, the equal of the best, both in the hunt and in the inner circle where the laws and customs of the pack were unfolded. They were prouder still that they had taught him to believe that the human race, to a greater extent than any other race of animals, was inhuman. Just what the human race was, Cropier never knew, however, for Grandy kept him far away even from the cowboy's trails. As the years passed, the fame of Cropier spread widely, for the proud coyotes could not help bragging about him to everybody they met, and the other animals began to envy the clever pack that had made the man-child into a coyote. Naturally enough, Cropier became the chief surgeon of the pack. When a cactus thorn or porcupine quill lodged in the foot or embedded itself in the muzzle of any of his brethren, Cropier, with his supple human hand, pulled it out. Thus the years ran through their ceaseless glass, and the shadow of time lengthened among the pack. Grandy, for all his wisdom, grew too feeble to follow the trail, too heavy and slow to pull down the alert, bounding pronghorn, or to nip the heels of the fleeting buffalo calf. His teeth loosened so that he could no longer tear the savory meat from the bone or crunch out the juicy marrow. Then one day, Grandy went out alone to hunt and did not return, and everyone knew that he had gone down the long, long trail that has no turning. But there was no longer need for anyone to help Cropier. He was sturdy and supple, swift as a bird in flight. Often he got the better of the pack in the hunt and outwitted his brother coyotes every day. Many of them began to wonder if they had done such a wise thing, after all, in making Cropier a member of their pack. Thus ends chapter one.